She'll make it this time. Yeah, it looks fast and strong, and uh, that's all I know about boats. I'll tell yeah. you what, we'll get in and we'll try it out and let you know. <laughs> Less than a week ago, a small craft and its crew left New York and headed for home. Right, 087, England, here we come. We were sitting off for the second time in 12 months in pursuit of a record that had stood for more than 30 years. Oh, I'm happy and gay as I'm sailing away. Since the days of the sailing clippers, ships have battled to knock days, then hours off the journey time between New York and England. The Queen Mary, how'd you like to come with me? The ship is all British. By 1938, Britain's Queen Mary had reduced the crossing time to under four days, and she held that record for 14 years. Then, in 1952, the liner United States on her maiden voyage clipped 10 hours off the record and took the Blue Ribbon to America, where it's remained ever since. But last year saw the start of an audacious new challenge for this title, in the shape of a purpose-built twin-hulled powerboat, little bigger than one of the lifeboats on the United States. It meant covering the 2,900 nautical miles from the Ambrose Light outside New York to the Bishop Rock Lighthouse in the Scillies in less than the record time of three days, 10 hours and 40 minutes. Our first attempt was skippered by Ted Tolman. I was on board to record the crossing. Richard Branson was the sponsor. Jay Blythe, the number one. And Dag Pike was our navigator. Clear of the rough weather in mid-Atlantic, we ran short of fuel. But by an incredible stroke of luck, a container ship steamed to our rescue. And crewman Steve Ridgway pumped the diesel aboard well aware that a problem-free fuel supply was essential for success. And despite bad weather and fuel shortages, we did almost make it. Until, with just 140 miles to go, disaster struck. The bottom's split. The whole of the bottom of the hull? Split. Split. We were shipping so much water that there was no alternative. We had to abandon ship and await rescue. But even as we were winched to safety and on our way back to dry land, the sight of the Challenger going down so close to the Bishop Rock raised the inevitable question. Would we go again? Skipper Ted Tillman would be unavailable, building yachts for the America's Cup. But Richard Branson was as committed as ever to winning the Blue Ribband. Um, but, um, I think that uh, it's quite likely that, that uh, quite likely that we might that we'll do it again. And true to his word, just six months later, a new boat of different design had been commissioned for a second attempt early in the summer of 1986. May the crew win back that coveted Blue Ribbon title for Great Britain. I give you Virgin Atlantic Challenge 2. <laughs> With only eight months between the drawing board and the starting line, it had been decided that Richard Branson would captain the new craft himself. He'd been promised the experience and camaraderie of most of the first crew to back him up. I'm glad you're mayor. We'll have to form a club, I think. New to that club was Pete Downey, soon to be cruelly cheated of his place on board. To see progress on the boat itself, I joined my new skipper on his first visit to the yard of Brook Yachts in Lowestoft. Do you reckon that's it? <laughs> yes. 
With a track record of fast military boats, the yard was well placed to tackle this yeah, new is. contract. I'll tell you one thing, it looks very small, doesn't it? <laughs> well, go on. Hey, it's Peter. Hello, Peter. Peter. How are you? Hi. How's it going? Hello. I mean, six weeks from uh, the first cutting of the plates to now. Peter Burkett is co-designer of the new boat. While Challenger 1 was a twin-hulled catamaran, her successor is a more traditional monohull. Yes, we're, we're right in the area of the engines right now. And, uh, the decision to change designs has its advantages. It not only leaves more room for the twin 2,000 horsepower turbocharged diesel engines and their fuel tanks, it's also quicker to build. And that's a vital plus if the second attempt is to get afloat in good time. Yeah. So, and then there's a much bigger cabin area, isn't there? There is yeah. a much bigger cabin, and it's much, much closer to the quiescent point, which means the motions in the cabin should be a lot less, and you should actually get a lot more rest than you did last time. We're going to have a loo? <laughs> oh, yes. A um, loo? A real loo? By popular demand, <laughs> there's a, a loo this time. <laughs> Inevitably, seeing the new aluminium hull being built came second to finding out how the new boat would perform. She will be able to plane at a much lower speed, but at the same time, I'm expecting the top speed somewhat better than last time. <laughs> yeah. Like what? If we put about 5% on the top speed, then I'll think we've had a, a very good build. 5% on last year's? Oh, yes. So that's, what, 50-something? 50 52, 53. Will it get us the whole way across the Atlantic? <laughs> oh, without a doubt. <laughs> I've seen a that before somewhere. <laughs> Within just three months, she was taking shape and almost ready. And on May the 14th, Britain waited to welcome her. Richard Branson had invited Princess Michael of Kent to give her a right royal send-off. It gives me great pleasure to name this ship Virgin Atlantic Challenger II. May she have more success than her predecessor. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Now what? Huh? Yeah? Let's yes? go. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this happened last time. <laughs> Ready, steady, no. <laughs> I'll go and push it. <laughs> you promised. <laughs> Three tours for the Virgin Atlantic Towns of Two. Okay. Hip, hip, hip. Hey! Hip, hip, hip. Hey! Hip, hip, hip. Hey! North Sea, trials began in earnest to test how the boat and her crew would perform in a variety of sea conditions. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> and it's got a different sensation than the last boat. It's sort of going like this through the water. I, I definitely think we're all going to feel a little bit more spooky than we did last time. Queasy, the last, a little bit more queasy, that's the word, yes. Last time it was much more just the jarring thing, but uh, this time it's much more, yeah. <laughs> Fifty knots, Challenger seemed to plane almost effortlessly, but every knot counts. Squeezing more thrust out of the engines, already running at full speed, depends on fine-tuning the power drives themselves. Hello, Sonny. It's Chris here. Chris Whitty, the project organiser, must take some fairly uncompromising decisions to get the propellers finished perfectly and in time. You know where the dramas are. No, I mean, everything's running all right here with the boat, but it, it's, it's propellers again. 
Specially cast in Italy, the propellers are the most critical part of the boat's power train. For greater efficiency when she's planing, only the bottom half of each propeller is in the water. A mass of spray is thrown up into the surrounding cowl to create a jet stream, which can then be directed to steer the boat. But on this large scale, these drives are quite new, and getting the best boat speed from a given number of engine revs is a matter of trial and error. We only could pull, well, I think it was 1860, and there was a 120 rev difference between the port and starboard prop. So they're, they're a long way out in terms of balance. I've still had to reject three because of the pitting. Yeah, but no, I'm not going to run them. I mean, if they're rejected, they're rejected. You're on the plane tomorrow, all right? You've got to bring those two guys with you. Uh, and when they get here, it's confiscated passports because they've got to stay here and fix those props, all right? Okay, Sonny. I'll see you then tomorrow, okay? Bye. On board Richard Branson's canal boat, the rest of the project was being meticulously planned. RV2 is the same drilling rig. Um, it's conveniently located in 4701 North, 4701 West. Rendezvous points for refueling have to be precisely placed and every possible problem anticipated. How does uh, the change of RV2 affect us in relation to uh, distance? Of distance it? is almost the same. Oh, I see. Yeah, so very little. It, it just comes out. It's still in the Flemish Pass. Oh, I see. So it's, you know, distance wise, it's probably within 20 miles. What can go wrong that can completely seed the boat up and stop us, which we can't fix out at sea? Very few things, apart from a total engine failure or transmission failure or, you know, really bad hull damage, apart from that, very little, you know, I mean, you can always get the thing running. If the all the electrics go, we can still run the engines and start the engines and Dag's navigation with these. If we lose all our power on the navigation side, we will have a backup Loran, which is a totally portable unit with its own antenna, its own battery power supplies, switch it on and it tells you where you are. And that will take us at least as far as Southern Ireland after that, we're on our own. Well, Chafin is his sextant. <laughs> Equally vital is finding a three-day window of calm weather. The Met Office in Bracknell will provide forecasts up to five days ahead. And for the build-up to the crossing, Met Office man Peter Deeks will be coming to New York to help us decide when the time is right. Mm. What we're really hoping for is the sort of situation in which the Azores High here extends across to UK so that most of the more active depressions will travel across to the north of your route. You, you can organise that for us. Is that wishful thinking? Yes. It was clear that June was the best bet for the weather window. But would everything, especially those propellers, be ready in time for the final trials? Yes, sort of. Where am I such a poster? Okay. Now, baby. We're ready to try. Since I'd be using home video cameras throughout the crossing, running into rough weather was in fact quite useful for practicing shooting. We have. It's got to get worse before it gets better, as they say. Why are you looking so cheerful? I'm not bloody cheerful. <laughs> I'm feeling like death. I'm trying to get out of this quickly. I have a vested interest in getting out of it quickly. But the rough seas were also to put an end to our engineer Peter Downey's part in the record attempt. Oh, Which one is it? The right? Yeah, the right. The right one. Well, you're just at the top of the steps. Yeah, I was going back up the deck. Yeah. Hanging on, and just hit that bloody big hole you hit. Yeah, big hole. Real big bust. Real... tied up. I want, I want a baton or a straight, something solid that we can tie together with the whole thing. all I want, isn't it? Something rigid. Um, we need a long strip. Oh, 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 we need a long strip. Bricks and Coast Guard. Bricks and Coast Guard, this is Virgin Atlantic Challenger. We have one crew member on board with a broken ankle. We are entering Salzburg. Could you arrange an ambulance, please? Um, our ETA will be uh, 1500, over.
Whatever pain he was suffering, Pete Downey's biggest blow was knowing he'd be out of the crossing. It was now only four days before Challenger was due to be shipped to America. New York welcomed Challenger 2, just as she had her predecessor, at the fashionable Water Club in Manhattan. Although out of the crew, it was vital that Pete Downey's knowledge of the boat and its engines should be passed on to his successor, Eki Rastig, who'd installed the German engines. Well, he was done it last year, so he did the same thing, right? Yeah, we have a lot of things to do. Yeah, but you concentrate on the things that affect you, that's all. Uh, uh, what's, what's the sort of sea state out there at the moment? Well, uh, waves are something like about five metres in places. Wow, very mixed seas. Yeah, it's a bit big for us at the moment. <laughs> but if the Atlantic wasn't ready for us, neither were we ready for the Atlantic. Checks on our hull reminded us just how vulnerable Challenger was travelling at 50 knots. Hit something. Very slight. Very slight. Catch marks there. So then it was thrown and off by the prop, thrown presumably. Thrown off by the prop and, and hit presumably it hit here. Or well, this may have even been something else. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's looking interesting, I must say, but this weather pattern. It's all calming down a great deal since the day. I, I, th I think compared with last year, if we had charts like this last year, we would have been halfway across by now. <laughs> but, uh... The right long-term forecast could arrive at any time, and we'd only get 24 hours notice of the off. But any delay did give us longer to practice for all eventualities, even changing propellers at sea. I think that's probably OK. This one's on the end. I know, because I've fixed it. Uh, so that should be OK when we need it. Most important of all was to ensure that the two giant diesel engines were ready for the marathon ahead. Becky? Yeah, yeah. How's it going? How's it going? Not bad. Not bad? How long do you think it'll take to finish? Oh, I don't know. Eki checked everything. The last thing he'd want is to spend time down here doing running repairs. Then the weather began to look more and more promising with every chart that appeared. <laughs> this is the real decider, isn't it? This one is creeping up. Four now. or day five. Yes, it's uh, highly critical, this one. Suspense is killing, isn't it? No, yes. Is it right, though, Peter? It's as right as we ever are at that sort of range. It's certainly a forecast of good condition. It was as good as we could hope for. So, at 5 a.m. last Thursday morning, Dag made the final equipment checks and everything was looking good. The challenge was beginning. dawn broke over Manhattan, we took the course of every Blue Ribbon Challenger, past the grand old lady who'd seen them all on their way. Five, four, three, two, one. That's three minutes after six. Quebec time. Well, you know, many thanks for that. Uh, we appreciate all your help. Thanks a lot. Over and out. Uh, we've just passed the Ambrose Light, we're on our way. Could we have a link call through to our London HQ, please, over? Here, the largest record store in Europe was preparing to add one more title to its collection. A control room set up inside the shop was ready to feed us all the technical guidance we'd need throughout the crossing. The 50 knots and the conditions are excellent. Are you going to stay asleep the whole trip? <laughs> One must conserve one's energy, you know. <laughs> Gotta sustain it so that in emergencies you're alive and ready for action. Yes. In the meantime, 
<laughs> With several hours of dead flat seas, the journey was fast, but tedious. You know, eating is about the only thing you can do to re relieve the boredom around here. Hours and hours and hours of nothing happening. Cheese! <laughs> well, as we suspected, our period of superb weather was not very long lived. At the moment, the seas are breaking up, and eight hours on down the track, we've got the sort of movements that we've come to know and uh, one might almost say love of Challenger. We're all being thrown around a fair bit as she goes along, but she is handling magnificently, and we are expecting to be at our first rendezvous at least one hour ahead of schedule. Ah, again, again. Neutral. Neutral. Our first problem. Flying off the top of the swell, our propellers had over-revved, causing automatic sensors to cut the engine suddenly. It's a shame, that. But it wasn't only the engines that complained. With power lost, the heaving swell could rapidly bring on nausea. Well, I'm glad you were busy up front while I was busy at the back. <laughs> but for the first time, getting very white. Underway again, the engines cut out many times more. Anything seriously wrong? Air intake goes to flap with air intake. And then shut off the engine completely. Oh, Imperial Dartmouth, the Imperial Dartmouth. This is Virgin Atlantic Challenger 2. Virgin Atlantic Challenger 2. Do you read over? In spite of the problems, we reached our first refueling stop ahead of schedule. 30 miles off the coast of Nova Scotia, this mini tanker waited to put eight tons of fuel on board. It was also our chance to take on supplies of food and engine oil. In little over an hour, and with spirits high, we were off again. Night lay ahead as we powered away on the second leg of our crossing. Well, the end of our first night at sea has left us uh, a little bit uh, bruised, I think. The seas have been fairly moderate at about uh, one to two metres, and the boat has been going pretty well as fast as it can, something like 47 knots. Everybody around here seems to uh, be feeling the uh, pinch as far as sleep is concerned. Oh, you go go for it. Right. Well, we, we're well over a thousand miles, aren't we now? We, we're yep, coming up yep. to uh, about the second refueling, which is very short time away will be what about 12:50, won't we? 12:50 yes, miles well, down track. That's right. Yes. yes. I find this this one a great mental block. The secondary fueling because you it's where you sort of switch off one side of the ocean and head for the other side because you're really at the point of no return when you live leave, leave here and yes. and we're really going out into the Atlantic then that's you're on your own chum after that. It's one of the great grey areas of the world, the cold foggy waters of the Grand Banks. 
Check with the Challenger before you increase your pressure. Check the no, we're, we're checking it by our delivery meters here. Let us know as soon as they have the 3750 on the high gate. Everything was going smoothly. Little did we know that the steadily rising fuel gauges were measuring not diesel, but the extent of our problems. Bleed them all. What? What do you think's happened then? We've got no fuel pressure. I told you that during the uh, filling, the water stroke fuel blue alarm came on. Does that mean anything? What's it? Yeah. The engine came no more running. Why? Well, I have the water in the cylinder now. From the last refueling? Yeah. You think there was water in the fuel? Yeah, but this is poor water. Okay. Dear Lord, help us in a lot of need. Forgive us our sins. Uh, we're disconnect. Uh, we're disconnect now, uh, Eric. Right? It's maybe the tank half half empty. Have you emptied? Have you emptied both catch tanks? That's what we've got set up. In our tanks. That's just solid water. That's basically water with just a little bit of colouring from uh, the three tons of fuel we had left on board. Which is all a bit sad. <laughs> It looked as if we might have to abandon the whole attempt. We had to start thinking about uh, other ports, really. Yeah, there's only one logical port from here, and that's St John. There's nothing else in Newfoundland or Canada that's anywhere near, apart from St John, so it's a much cooler one. It's about 220 miles from here. Jesus. Which, even if we've got one engine going at 10 knots, yeah. is a day's steaming. And the weather deteriorated as well. Yes, yeah, so this is the more worrying part of it. This depression coming out after this sort of it was closing the weather window for us. It's, uh, it's not happy. Anyway, we've still got an hour to go home, so we've got eight hours. In fact, the only hope was to pump out every last drop of contaminated fuel and fill up again. Down below, the engineers worked frantically. The rest of us grabbed the precious moments of rest. If we have to come out and do the procedure again, can we get the fuel from your day tank, which has been separated over? The episode had cost us seven and a half hours. As we refueled again from a different tank, the London control room recalculated our chance of success. At least they reckoned the delay would allow the weather to improve. We still got a chance, and uh, I suppose it's down to 50-50 now, whereas it was uh, pretty good a few hours ago. Late that night, Eki's hours of work were rewarded by the sweet sound of a running engine. The last 12 to 15 hours have been terribly disappointing. At the moment, we're just running and standing, running and standing. We get up and we get going, and in our heart of hearts, we know that It'll only last for a few minutes before another problem occurs. More water will get into the engine and we'll have to come off the plane and stop to drain that down. But for Steve Laws, the engineer we'd taken on board at RV2, we would never have made it. He volunteered to ride in the fumes, heat and deafening noise of the engine room to cope with all the breakdowns. The situation was desperate. Disposable filters for cleaning the fuel supply were being used up rapidly. While Eki tried to dry out and reuse the fuel we had, our control room in London planned a rescue bid. They're coming packs of 10 and we're looking for two packs of 10 filters. I need to find a, preferably a twin engine light aircraft for, uh, with, that could fly out within one hour down to St. Morgan. Have you got any ideas on that? The RAF's Nimrod base at St. Morgan in Cornwall had offered to find us in mid-Atlantic and airdrop a new supply of filters. Switches are correct. No drop now. 
It was a faultless operation. The filter package dropped into the sea within yards of Challenger and in a few minutes was brought aboard. We were now back with a chance, but far from improving, the weather now turned for the worse. Yes, hello Peter, we've got uh, quite severe problems now. We've, we've, we're down lower than 35 miles, sorry, 35 knots, which means we won't get the record. Uh, the waves are coming, quite big swells coming straight at us. are going to try and make it for the record, then we've absolutely, certainly got to uh, push this boat to its very limit and even beyond. That is uh, the only way that we're going to be able to get to the finishing line since we're now so far behind. In fact, we were six hours late when we reached RV3 in the middle of the night. Even so, the Irish Navy refuelled us in record time. We'd taken an incredible chance that night by powering on at full speed in heavy seas and the pitch dark. And that bad weather ahead now forced us to change course onto a longer route. Okay. The reason we're going south was because we had a depression sitting there and we wanted to go through the part of the depression which had the least wind. So by going south it, was a, it added a 25 miles to our route, but it turned we covered the ground quicker because we could maintain a higher speed in the weather conditions. Simple as that. Up above, Watchdog 5, our shepherding Nimrod, kept us on target for the rock. Bishop's Rock, 1810 GMC. How do you copy? Sounds fine with me. Thank you, over. Good day! <laughs> Most of us prepared for the homecoming with a fresh change of clothes. But for some, exhaustion overcame all elation. Congratulations. Dag's got eight. I've got eight, that's it. I can sit down and do nothing now. <laughs> We'd done it and taken two hours and nine minutes off the record for the Blue Ribbon. Isn't he strong? If you're doing so much hard work on this trip. Today, I throw down the gauntlet to anyone who is willing to take up the challenge. We wish them well. <laughs>